Welcome to this final lecture video for Module 2. This is on the Part D notebook that involves plotting and matplotlib. In this lecture notebook, we will learn how to visualize data in both two and three dimensions using matplotlib. We will understand some plotting options that allow you to resize figures, create arrays of figures, and change how data are visualized. You will also see how to use some built-in NumPy functions for creating regularly spaced input data that are useful for plotting purposes. There are a few activities here. This one might you might find a little bit challenging, but I do give a lot of instructions in code comments to follow in it, and I will discuss it in this video. So I think Overall, I'm expecting this to take a couple of hours, including watching this video and doing some experimentation. I'm not showing everything that matplotlib can do. In fact, I'm showing a very limited number of things that matplotlib can do. There's a lot of documentation and tutorials here. I provide a link here to PyPlot, which is our main uh, plotting tool within matplotlib. And there is a PyPlot tutorial. And you might find that you want to take this information uh, that's provided on this web page and make your own Jupyter notebook that has some of these examples for your own reference later on that allow where you can also play with things. So I highly recommend that because you could create all these different markdown cells and uh, code cells and create these plots and then just see what happens as you play around with it. So I highly recommend that as an option. Um, there, I'm not going to read everything in here, but I am just going to reiterate. I going to exclusively focus on PyPlot, the PyPlot module within matplotlib. And I'm really going to encourage you to, again, follow that tutorial and turn its contents into your own notebook, the one that I just linked to and showed you there. So we begin with an understanding of the components of a figure versus a plot. Python's matplotlib library emulates many features of MATLAB in case you have any familiarity with that. If you don't, don't worry, I'm going to cover it carefully here. It uses the same layout, however, as MATLAB. So if you have any experience, you'll probably find it very familiar. So you should think of it like this. A figure is an object that holds all of the plots that you're going to make in that figure. That figure holds axes. You can have multiple axes, sub-axes within that figure, and I will show that. Um, the Y and X axes are given as, uh, are considered two different axes within these axes. There's a title to the plot and a Y label and an X label you can assign. Let's go ahead and get started to see this in action. Now there's a magic command for plotting in a notebook. This code cell is uh, very useful for making sure that images appear correctly in a notebook, an uh, interactive notebook environment like this. You wouldn't have this in just a, a Python script. You wouldn't use that at all. You would just use like plot that show in order to make figure show to the screen. This next line is needed where I'm going to import the PyPlot module of matplotlib as PLT. So I can just use PLT for short. So I'm going to run that now. And I do also suggest here that you might want to experiment matplotlib notebook for some additional interactivity. However, th there are some known issues that can happen with that depending on what browser or operating system you might be working with. So if you start experiencing some weird things, if you try that, don't worry about it. Just use this inline command. So here, this creates an empty figure, and then I'll say, well, show the figure. Well, there's nothing to show. So nothing happens other than this figure has been created, but there's no figure to plot. The basic plot commands plot x data versus y data, which is much like you think of how you plot a function in algebra, where you would have coordinates of x comma y. The default behavior is to connect data pairs via a straight solid line. Uh, the linspace function within numpy, np.linspace, with a, b, n as the arguments generates endpoints in the closed interval a to b, including the endpoints. So n minus two of the points are interior to this interval. This is commonly used when wanting to generate regularly spaced data to plot. So I show an example here. I want to create a thousand data points from negative pi to pi. I'm going to plot the function x times sine of 1 over x, and I'm using the built-in sine function within NumPy. I add a title. Notice I'm doing some tech, like you've seen from the 01 Jupyter uh, lecture. 
where I have the dollar signs here so I can display this correctly as tech and I have like the curly brackets to group the negative one as a power. So this is X times sine of one over X, X to the negative one power. And I'm setting the font size to 18. You should try changing the font size. You should try changing the color of the font. How might you do that? Again, you might refer to the tutorials of PyPlot and I have an, uh, the link again here for an activity with you. After I plot the title, I, I plot the X and Y pairs. I can move the title around. I could plot, I could add this plot title after the plot command and get the same thing. But I don't do that here. Here's where I plot it. You see the blue curve. It's connected. It has all this funny behavior near the zero, X equals zero. And there's that font. And now you can change that font size, whatever you want. And you might also consider adding uh, labels to the X and Y axes. In fact, I ask you to do that in the activity. If you want to see how to add axes, ax labels to the axes, again, I refer you to this tutorial. And notice it's very simple. Plot dot, they're assuming that you've imported uh, matplotlib pyplot as PLT, right? They're shown here. Here's how you plot, use, oh, I shouldn't have clicked on that. PLT dot Y label and then some text. And you can also imagine changing the font size and also the color of that text. And you could look at the options. I, I encourage you to try to experiment. This is not a long notebook, but I did think, say that I think it would take a couple hours in terms of just the amount of time you'd spend looking at some of the documentation and trying your own experimentation. So the actual instructions for this, let's just read it carefully. Look at that tutorial, just for reference, copy and paste the code cell, plotting all of this stuff below. So you wanna take all of this info, you want to copy it, all the contents there, you want to paste them here, and then I want you to plot the function using a thicker red dashed dotted curve. And so again, in the tutorial, if you said, how would I, how could I create like a dashed dotted curve? You might look at like, well, there's a dashed curve. How is that done? And you could start seeing here, there's red dashes. What about a dashed dotted? And you might search dashed dot or dot, dot dotted dash, well, you can find it. I'm sure you can find it. If you can't, I will help you with it. But there's various uh, commands here for showing how to plot the different types of uh, dash dotted curves. I don't think it's necessarily going to do it there. I wonder if I just search for, there we go, line style. Here it is. The line style options. So if you look at the different line properties here for the style, you can see the different options here. There's this, this would create a solid line, that would create a dash line. One of these is going to produce a dash dotted line, dotted dash line, whatever we call it. What did I call it? Dash, dash dotted line curve. So you plot the function using a thicker, meaning I want the line width to be thicker. And you can again look at in, in here what the line width is. You can set line width with a certain property and see examples of this. Here's how they set line width to be two. You might try setting line width to be four. Play around, see what you like. And then I want you to add and edit, edit comments to at least three different lines of code to explain what they are doing. So I have these code comments. I want you to add comments in here uh, because you will add some code and I want you to edit some of these comments as well, personalize them. Another handy way of generating a vector or array of numbers for either computations or plotting is using the numpy.arrange function and it has a start, a stop, and an increment. This will fill up the half open interval from start to stop. So it will go from start up to, but not including stop, much like we saw with array slicing. So here, x1 goes from negative pi up to, but not including pi, uh, pi in increments of, I, here I'm using scientific notation, so that's 0.01, one times 10 to the negative two. And now y1 is that x1 times sine of x1, and here I'm plotting with a line style that is dashed lines in black. I'm making the color black in the line style. And in fact, I'm going to add some, you should, it's always a good idea to add just a blank space uh, after each comma for readability. So I'll do that in a couple places here. There we go. So here's this dashed curve that shows I go up to, but not including pi. And then here's a scatter plot of a noisy linear function. So within the random sub package, again of NumPy, I use the rand command with 100 to generate 100 random numbers. And then I'm taking five times 
those numbers, and then I'm adding some random values to them to create a noisy function. And then I'm using the scatter plot function within the pie plot. And so here's the scatter plot. You see the kind of the behavior of the linear five times growth. If you look at the x axis, it goes from zero to one. The y axis goes from zero to six. Why does it go up to six? Because I'm taking something like five around here and then I'm adding noise to it, right? That's what this is doing, is adding noise. So I'm just showing this so that you know how to do some scatter plots. You'll also see this later. There's again in the pie plot tutorial, there's lots of plot options. Here's the scatter plot. Here's different types of line styles. There's many examples within here that you should look at. Again, it shouldn't take you too long, maybe an hour or two to, to turn in a lot of this into your own notebook of examples. And then there's there's more to even look at if you if you don't look that hard even. You can just start clicking around on links and finding more examples in here. So there's intros and then you know click on more stuff, do some more searches, you'll find lots of other examples. Let's now talk about subplots and 3D plotting using the MPL toolkits. Subplots are one way to arrange multiple plots into one figure. The subplot function takes the following arguments here. I need to uh, fix that. There we go. I wanted it to be bold. You add a subplot, add underscore subplot, and you say, the number of rows, the number of columns, and then you say the plot number, which is the, the subplot you're adding. So as you, as I, if you recall, so I'm going to create this, I create some array A for my plotting here. I also provide a link to mesh grid that you might find useful in understanding some of the things here. But let's just focus on here. I create a figure. I say that the figure size should be 10 by six in terms of the units that it has. So that's, this should be for the vertical, the number, the size of the rows versus the size of uh, basically in the columns, like axis zero versus axis one. Now, axes one, I add a subplot. I want to create a one by three array of plots, and this will be the first one. This is a second set of axes I can create, but I commented it out just to show you what happens when I comment it out. And if I have that one by three array and I say, now I want the third plot number. Notice plot number does not index from zero. I goes one, two, three, but this again is commented out. I plot some things in axes one. I'm setting some Y labels. So you have to do things a little different with axes commands when you're adding a subplot versus when you use plot and you would just add like a, a title. You say plt.title or plt.x label or Y label. Here I need to set a Y label and set certain things when I'm doing it directly on the axes. So that's just a little nuance. This is also commented out right here. This I put everything here in a doc string to comment things out. So there's a lot of code comments here to read. But right now, if you run this, I'll generate something in axes one and axes three, all within the figure, and then I give it a tight layout to remove unnecessary white space around the axes. When I run that, here you go. This is the This is what I'm plotting. The, what I'm actually plotting here, you can read it to see things if you're interested, but notice that there's this gap in the middle. This is where that second set of axes would be plotted if I wasn't commenting it out. And I suggest you uncomment it out, and you could remove these doc strings to see exactly what I'm talking about. So now when I run that, there's now three figures. And if you got rid of the fig.type layout, Notice it looks a little different now. Notice how it's kind of like all this a little bit more squished together. It's not showing up as nice. The fig.tight layout then generally improves the way that the, a, a bunch of subfigures should display correctly. A bunch of uh, subplots should display correctly. So I'm gonna undo that. So that's something for you to do and play with. I will also pretend A is a function. I have this other set of plot in here. I'm just showing more commands. I'm doing scatters. I'm doing 3D plots here. The important um, thing to realize to do 3D plotting is from the toolkits dot plot 3D. I have to import axes 3D. I create a figure. I'm labeling the figure number two to distinguish it from this figure, which was figure number one. And I'm sizing that figure. You should play around with the fig size both here and here. So like if I made this, let's say 10 by 12 and I run that, right? Notice it's much, larger in one direction. You can just see, like if I make that five, see the difference? 
it shrunk it in this vertical direction. And if I make this five by six, there it is again in that direction, a little bit different 10. So you should play around with that and get a, a, a sense of the how that's changing the sizes of figures. But anyways, we import axes 3D, and now when I add subplots, notice I'm saying that the projection should be in a 3D mode. And now I'm plotting, I'm doing a 3D scatter plot, I'm plotting a wireframe, and I'm also plotting a surface. And I'm doing this again just to show you options. You should Google or look at additional tutorials if you're interested in more plotting. This is just to get you into the idea of how we can plot and the tools available to you. But here's some this plotting in 3D. So that's kind of the end, so to speak, of this lecture. This, there's two activities to end this notebook. So this main activity, which is using curve fitting and plotting tools, I have a more involved activity for you, more than you've probably seen up to this point. So we're gonna use num, a polyfit function within NumPy, and I have a link here for you to look at and it has examples for you to play with if you'd like to look at it, including some map plot, uh, plotting. You might want to put this into the notebook as something for you to reference. Add these pieces of code into the notebook and look at it. Before you do this activity, you might add all of that above this cell as code cells with some markdown to explain what's going on. But we're going to do some least squares fits of polynomials to data. Least squares is a type of regression that is very common in the computational and data sciences and will actually be something that's a focus on one of the introductory notebooks on machine learning that we will see in the sixth module in this course. It is heavily used in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and statistics, least, uh, regression, that is, re, uh, least squares regression techniques. In the code cells below, there are multiple things that are missing. You have to fill them in. Num, the num data denotes the number of data points used to fit a polynomial curve to the noisy data defined by x data comma y data, where the x data belongs to the interval negative four, four. You need to finish the code cells below so that a scatter plot of the noisy data is generated. A third order polynomial is fitted to the noisy data. Again, read the polyfit documentation and look over the examples it provided to see how to do this and how to use the poly1d function to generate a polynomial function p from the output of the output of the polyfit function. Use linspace within numpy to create a regular uniform grid of 100 points in -4 to 4 called xgrid and then plot x grid and p of x grid. p should be a function that acts on x grid to give you the polynomial plot. So I have some questions for you. I have some lots of code comments, a number of data, setting number of points. I generate my random data from negative 4 to 4. I generate my noisy data on my three-dimensional, um, excuse me, my third-order polynomial. And then here, so you run this code cell to generate the noisy data. And then here, I am missing things that you need to complete. Look at the code comments to complete. You need to plot the scatter of the noisy data. You need to fit a polynomial of a certain order to this data, the third order to that data. Again, refer to the documentation. You need to create a polynomial on that data. And then I'm just asking you to plot the result of that polynomial fit. And so that requires you to complete these other code cells. So. In actuality, once you do it, you'll find there's not much code to write. You really just have to fill in the missing components here. And then in the end, you should see a scatter plot of data and, an, and the true curve and, that generated that data, the truth. And then you should also see your best fit and it should be a close approximation to that. that that's it for the main activity to do there. And then of course, there's a summary activity for you to fill in with some complete sentences again, saying what you've seen and learned with your own examples. And this is again for, I will look at it, but it's mainly for yourself to summarize the key points that you would like to refer to when you were to look back at this as a resource for yourself in the future. So thanks for listening. That ends the module two lecture notebooks.